Thank you very much, Mr. Trovan, for being with us on Zooming In today. My pleasure. There's so many things we don't know about uh, this disease and yes. also, you know, how they spread and the severity of the infection and stuff like that. So um, just based on the information we already know, um, how do you compare this to any, you know, epidemic in recent history? Well, I, I think this is very similar to the the, the process we went through with uh, H1N1, it's very similar to the process we going, went through with MERS and with uh, SARS. Mm -hmm. um, when a, a deadly disease first appears, people are scared, naturally. Um, people, uh, people are afraid of the unknown, people are afraid of things they can't control. Mm. And people are afraid, afraid of things which cause um, stress and trauma. And th these new diseases, uh, which result in fatalities, particularly uh, a large number of fatalities, they, they create all those fear factors, and so we're, we're scared of it. But you know, once the science starts coming in, we can more rapidly get a handle on uh, how to control it. So as so I say, the mere fact we know it's a coronavirus means that we know already that the virus can be decontaminated with very simple, easily available materials like uh, soap or like alcohol. Mm -hmm. So you think it's on the level of uh, SARS, MERS, um, maybe Ebola, but not to the level of, for example, Spanish flu in well, 1918? Um, we always hope it's never going to get to that stage. Um, but at this early stage of, of a, an outbreak, we, we can't tell what's going to happen, whether it's going to uh, break out and become a pandemic or whether it's going to stay relatively local as an epidemic but be contained within the, uh, to a large extent, within the, the origin. So uh, MERS and SARS, thankfully, were largely contained. Mm. They didn't become true pandemics. Uh, H1N1 became a pandemic, but fortunately didn't end up being as, as, uh, as uh, disastrous as was feared. So um, it's, it, it's just too early days to say how it's going to go. Uh, hopefully, the Chinese authorities have uh, have discovered it and acted soon enough that it can be contained with it mainly within China. Mm -hmm. When can you tell? When can people, medical authorities, tell whether which direction this is going to go? Right. Um, well, the first indications will be uh, once we understand the full course of the disease. Say it takes three weeks from infection to full recovery, mm -hmm. or say it takes uh, ten days from initial infection to when you're no longer infectious, when you no longer can pass on the disease to someone else. If we find that over, a, say, a one-week or two-week period, the number of people who are progressing from initial infection out of the period from which they're infectious starts exceeding the number of new cases, then we can believe that we've got it under control. Mm. Or, or at least that we're going in the right direction. So what we'll definitely be looking for is uh, what is the rate of new cases. If the rate of new cases starts, continues to go up geometrically, then our control measures are not working. Mm. If it starts to plateau or, or slow down, then we can have some faith that our, um, our control measures are working. Just within last day, I think the infection number has gone up quite a bit, right? What was the number? Um, I, the number I read today was 2,790-something. Uh, in my like, impression, it was a big jump. And also, we have to consider, you know, in China, not, those numbers are heavily underestimated because not necessarily because the government is lying, but because those cases are only, can only be identified in what so-called 3A hospitals, the top right. hos hospitals. Yeah. And uh, consider a lot of people stop going to the hospitals because they don't want to wait in line for seven hours to get cross infected. Yeah. And again, the early days of an outbreak, it's really tough to know what the true numbers are for, the, for some of the reasons you're saying. First of all, you can only diagnose those patients who present to physicians who are capable of doing the diagnosis. Right. Second of all, um, so that will... Uh, push you towards underestimating. Second of all, once there's been a public, um, uh, a public information campaign, you might get a wave of people 
presenting themselves for diagnosis mm. who have been infected for several days. So that might falsely push up the number higher mm. for the day-to-day -day new infection rate. So it takes a little while before the numbers settle down that, um, where you're getting a steady state of the number of people, uh, the percentage of people who are getting infections who are presenting and the ability of the uh, medical authorities to actually do the diagnosis. So early numbers, it's always tough to say mm. what's going on. Let's talk about the lab, yep. the virus research lab. It's called MSB4 right. lab, Maximum Security Laboratory Level 4. Um, tell me about you know, the requirements for those labs and, and, and you think there's some worry that, you know, China might not be able to handle this. Right. right. So BSL-4 labs are the highest level of security for uh, biological laboratories. Um, basically, they're designed to enable safe work on the most dangerous of uh, pathogens, mm. uh, the ones that for which there's no prophylaxis, no cure, or no treatment, mm. uh, and f uh, basically which uh, transmit very easily between humans and cause uh, high morbidity and high mortality. The, the, the basic requirements for these labs is that um, you have controlled access into and out of the lab, uh, that the lab itself should be hermetically sealed. That means there should be an under pressure in the lab. The, the atmospheric pressure inside the lab should be lower than the external uh, uh, normal atmospheric pressure of the air. So that if there is a leak in the body, in the uh, building, the air comes from the inside, uh, from the outside in, mm. not from the inside out. Mm. So obviously all that's designed to keep whatever's inside the lab, inside the lab. They have to have um, uh, filtered air coming in and filtered air going out. They have to have very frequent air changes. People who go into the lab have to go in through an airlock system. They have to take uh, decontaminating showers on the way in and on the way out. Mm. And so, uh, and then once they're in the lab, they're working in biosafety ca uh, cabinets, wearing full personal protective equipment. That's the suits with the ventilator and uh, hoods and uh, masks and everything so they don't have exposed skin. Um, they work in the biosafety cabinets so that whatever they're working on is worked on within that enclosed space within the enclosed lab. Mm. Um, and, and so uh, that, that's the basic requirements of working in that sort of lab. The, tr the trouble is when you create a very complex organization like that with very complex engineering as the, 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 the structure of the building, very complicated equipment, mm. uh, complicated procedures that people have to go through. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, and then you've got a living organism that you're working with which is not controlled. <laughs> it's, you know, it's a living organism. Uh, then you have what's called a complex adaptive system and things can go wrong that you can simply cannot foresee. So uh, the original comments I made back in the Nature article were more to do with not whether China should have these labs. I mean, China has a right to have public health labs, in fact, under the international health regulations, countries are encouraged to have a good uh, network of labs so that all populations are close enough to a lab who can, can make diagnoses for their diseases. The, my question was more whether the, uh, the, the culture that exists in um, Chinese uh, government structures and in, um, in organizations is structured in a way that can learn to adapt very quickly when the rules don't work. Mm. So in complex adaptive systems, you get things called emergent properties. These are things that you cannot forecast. And so there you have to be able to react to the unexpected very quickly. Mm -hmm. This means that you need to organize to be able to learn quickly which means that even the most junior person has to be able to question the decisions and knowledge of the most senior person. 
and it means that uh, the most senior people have to respect and listen to mm -hmm. all the junior people too. So that, that was the concern that I was, was stating, that's, that uh, I think in these sorts of labs, not just in China, but in countries around the world, we need to get a change in management attitude from one of very hierarchical structures mm -hmm. where the bosses say, this is the only way to do it, to ones where the people doing the work understand how they have to do it safely. And when, when uh, new knowledge appears, they're able then to change the system themselves mm. to keep it safe. According to the Nature magazine, yeah. um, SARS virus has been leaked from the Beijing lab for multiple times. What does that tell you? Well, to me, that if, if you have a major um, unintended release of a dangerous pathogen like that several times within the same organization over a short span of time, to me, it would be indicative that there's a systemic problem there. There's a problem with the system of management and of risk management in that facility. And so I would want to go in there uh, if, if I were responsible for trying to prevent these, these um, future releases of the, the virus. Uh, I'd want to go in there and study what were the, what were the underlying causes for why people made the decisions which led to the actions which led to the release. Mm -hmm. What were the management structures that made them think that that was the right thing to do that way? Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I say, it's, it's a, it becomes an issue of how you learn about your organization and how you learn about the way you do things. And those um, virus research labs, they are also there have been reports uh, that they're potentially being used for biochemical weapons development. What's your opinion? I've not seen any evidence of that. Um, China is a full member of the Biological Weapons Convention. They're a full member of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, and uh, under both of those conventions, it's illegal to, to uh, develop and produce stockpile research on offensive bi uh, biological weapons, or even toxin weapons, that is, um, chemicals created by biological organisms. So uh, China has um, international obligations not to uh, work on those organisms for offensive purposes or to keep weapons or uh, develop anything that might enable them to have weapons like that. Uh, as, as I say, to my knowledge, there's no indications anywhere that other countries suspect China of actually developing these biological weapons. Tim, tell me, why don't you think China is developing biological weapons? Biological weapons have been banned internationally since uh, the early 70s, 1972, the Biological Weapons Convention came into effect. China was an original signatory and is a full, fully signed up member for that convention. But my, by my, the way, that wouldn't persuade me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the main reason I don't think we see biological weapons uh, at the level of state enterprise is that they aren't very effective militarily. Um, they're very hard to control. Uh, you need to protect your own population, whether that's your soldiers or whether your civilian population, mm. uh, particularly if you're talking about a, a live agent. And for them to have any impact on the, the battlefield, you need to produce them in very, very large quantities and deliver them effectively. Mm -hmm. So and you're talking about it's not effective in the battlefield, but what if it's not used in the battlefield? Well, certainly um, biological weapons are being used uh, for assassination purposes. Um, there was a classic case of uh, Markov, who was a Bulgarian defector who was murdered in London with a biological weapon mm -hmm. by the, the yeah. Bulgarian secret services. So as a weapon of assassination, biological weapons are, are effective. Uh, as a weapon of terror, um, they could be very, very effective. Okay. You remember the anthrax letter outbreak here. Um, where just a, a very few uh, few letters sent in the early 90s um, 
with white powder, which turned out to be anthrax uh, toxin, caused a massive uh, overreaction, um, uh, security reaction, which was very, very disruptive. Now, if you put it in the big picture of things, uh, a number of people died, which is very tragic. But many, many more people die on the roads, or uh, many, many more people die by going to hospital, by getting infections while they're in hospital, mm -hmm. than they did through anthrax. But the fact of the matter is those letters did disrupt American society quite, quite considerably. So you can see how biological weapons uh, could be used for assassination, and you can also see how they might be used by a terror organization to disrupt. Uh, but as a, a battlefield weapon, uh, I don't see them as being very effective, which makes them not very attractive to uh, states, national governments. Mm -hmm. to have in their arsenal. Okay. What if they release the virus to, a, to another country in a populated area? Well, as we, we see with uh, a, a real pandemic, um, you can't just release a virus into one country. It won't just stay in one country. Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's an effective uh, virus in terms of warfare purposes, it's going to be virulent and it's going to be passed on, mm -hmm. which means then it can come back to your borders. Mm -hmm. In which case, before you release it, you have not only to have uh, treatment and prophylaxis for it, but you need to have prepared your entire population to be protected against it. Mm -hmm. So it makes it very ineffective. Mm -hmm. So the main reason you think um, China or any other countries is not developing biological weapon is because it's not effective? Yes, okay. as, a, as a military weapon. Uh -huh. What about chemical weapons? Chemical weapons. Um, also, uh, before that, which countries are currently developing biological weapons? No country admits to having a biological weapons program, but uh, uh, certainly there were concerns that Syria might be developing them uh, when there were the uh, uses of chemical weapons recently in the civil war there. And there's always a concern about North Korea. What are the North Koreans developing? So there's a concern that North Koreans have both chemical and biological weapons programs in addition to their nuclear program. So why does China need five to seven those high-level virus research centers? Um, if you look at countries around the world, most countries only have one such lab. Well, most countries don't have any labs at that level. And the, the, the advanced countries that do have them tend to have one. The US has a, a number, I think, probably in that same order of five to seven. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so China, which is obviously a much bigger country mm. uh, in terms of population, it's uh, five to six times bigger than the United States. Um, you could make a, a case that uh, both in terms of population, in terms of the scientific endeavor in biology, that uh, China has as much right to that number of biological laboratory, research laboratories as the United States. Certainly, um, every country has been encouraged by the World Health Organization to have a network of laboratories spread out geographically so that people have access to diagnostic capabilities. Mm. Um, so uh, there will always be a question as to whether we really need that many BSL-4 labs. Mm. but. I think the underlying question of do we need this research in, into biology? Do we need to understand diseases better? Certainly we do. We need, we, uh, I, I'm one of those who, uh, who believes that uh, most people in science are in science for the, the good of the world. And particularly most people in biology go into biology to, to improve the human condition. And so I think more, the more people we have working on understanding disease, the more chances are we're going to get to a position, a position where these outbreaks are much less scary. Because even if it's a new disease, we would have developed the capability to do faster detection, faster uh, diagnosis, that is, understanding what is the disease and how it progresses, and therefore getting to the position where we can create vaccines much more quickly. Tell me about Iraq. Iraq was developing biological weapons? Iraq was developing nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, and biological weapons, and long-range missiles. Um, 
And the, why do they develop? Because you said those weapons are not effective. Right. So uh, Iraq, if you think of it at the time, was in, um, had come out of a long war with Iran, um, a war which went on for eight, ten years. And Iraq's population was much smaller than Iran's. At one stage, they were worried they were going to be completely overwhelmed. And so they were looking at, uh, at any weapon system they could have which would give them an advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, chemical weapons did actually prove to be militarily useful for them in the Foul Peninsula when tens of thousands of Iranian soldiers overwhelmed their defenses and they used chemical weapons against the Iranians. That was effective because the Iranians had no protection. They, didn't ha they weren't a modern army with all the detection and protection equipment against chemical weapons. But they also developed biological weapons because they saw the war with Iran as being a war of attrition. Because of the numerical disadvantage in population, because of the economic disadvantage, uh, because of the s difference in the scale of the size of the two countries, they were looking for weapons of attrition as well as weapons of military significance. And so they were looking at um, biological weapons uh, either to attack uh, Iran's agriculture, weapons like wheat rusts and things like that, or things which might cause long-term chronic diseases. Uh, aflatoxin is a carcinogen, for example. Talking Things about like that. that, you said those, uh, you know, if you infect another country, it will eventually come back to your own people. Right. And so I, I think for some, a, a country like Iraq, then these become more like doomsday weapons. They don't ever intend to use them. They want the neighbors to know they have them so that if the existence of Iraq becomes threatened, mm -hmm. then they will use them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more like a deterrence rather than a weapon they ever intend to use. Would you say any country who has a doomsday mentality will likely to yes, develop such countries? Yes, and I think countries? this is part of the reason why you see North Korea so interested in its nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, they do see themselves as being, uh, as, as being vulnerable to outside pressures. Therefore, if they have this weapon, um, a nuclear weapon, then they will be effectively immune from from military attack mm -hmm. and I think that's why the Israelis so clearly have a nuclear weapon is mm -hmm. that um, you know, using a nuclear weapon against Egypt will probably be very detrimental to Israel itself because of the proximity but you know they have it there so that uh, the the Arab community knows as a whole that if the state of Israel is it's very if the state of Israel's very existence is threatened, then there is this weapon that will be used. Mm -hmm. And the reason you think China is not developing a, bio, a biological weapon is because they don't have a doomsday mindset. At least you believe they don't. I believe they don't, no. Uh, China has a very, very long history. It has a, long, a real sense of itself. Uh, I, I once was involved in a conversation with uh, Egyptian diplomats and Israeli diplomats. And, a certain lack of understanding of each other's basic uh, belief systems in that Israel at that stage had only been a state for 50 years, whereas Egypt had been yeah. <laughs> 3,000, 5,000 years. Right. Uh, you know, the Egyptian mentality is Egypt may cease to exist for 100 years, but it doesn't matter because Egypt will come back. Hmm. The Israelis don't have that mentality. Mm -hmm. Israel's only been there 50 years. If it's wiped off the face of the earth, it may never come back. Mm. China has been there since history began. Mm. China will always be there. I don't think, as a country, you have that mentality. I think as a country, China doesn't. But uh, what about the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party? Uh, that's beyond my level of competence, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to comment on that. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks.